Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series has proved to be a very interesting and challenging one entitled, In the Crucible with Christ. Hmm. This is lesson number seven in that series for August 13 of 2021, entitled, Indestructible Hope. That sounds like a good thing, Indestructible Hope. And as usual, we like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we have come this evening to talk about you and to discuss together uh, these messages from Scripture to try to understand how we should be involved with you in these crucibles. Guide and direct our thoughts. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Seventh-day Adventists believe, and it's based directly on Scripture, that just before the second coming of Christ, there will be a time of trouble such as never was since the world was created. That sounds scary. And if you're not too sure, if you're not familiar with that, go to Revelation chapters 15 and 16, and you can get scared. What grounds do we have for hope when we face such a crisis? C.S. Lewis wrote about a make-believe lion. Wanting to meet that lion, someone asked if the lion was safe. The person was told that he's, he's not safe, quote, but he's good. Hmm. <laughs> Do you have a personal relationship with God that is sufficient that you can trust Him no matter what happens? Jim? Even though we don't always understand God and He seems to do unpredictable things, that doesn't mean that God is against us. It simply means that we don't have the full picture yet. We struggle, excuse me, but we struggle with the idea that for us to have peace, confidence, and hope, God must be understandable and predictable. God needs to be, in our thinking, safe. As such, we see, excuse me, we set ourselves up for, the, for disappointment from the Bible study guide for August 13. Human beings on this earth live on the average of 60 to 80 years, depending on in which part of the world she or he lives. That is, assuming she or he survives through the first five years, which are the most dangerous years in most parts of the world. Thus, to our thinking, we tend to have a fairly short lifespan. We want things to happen right now. We do not want to have to think about what will happen a long time from now. We may not even be alive then. But true Christians with a full understanding of Scripture know that the problems we face in our world did not start on this planet. Carrie? Reading from Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon who fought back with his angels. That's from American Bible Society, 1992. Holy Bible, Good News Translation. And uh, Revelation 12, 7, New York. Okay. So that was the very first war. The wars that seemed like they haven't stopped since then. <laughs> What kind of war was that? Well, that's a good question. Uh, it clearly wasn't a war with weapons and bullets and planes and things like that. It had to be a war of ideas. And um, you wonder how a war like that would come to an end. I have a good friend who's passed now. He's no longer with us. But he suggested that the Father, God the Father, with his glory, stepped back a ways and shielded his glory while Jesus taking on, or Christ taking on a angel form, conducted a, a, a war of ideas back and forth. And finally, when it seemed like there was nothing more to be discussed, the Father showed up with his glory and Satan and his followers decided it was time to exit. So kind uh, of a debate. Kind of a, a very fierce debate. Reasoning, Discussion. Yeah, debate. Reasoning. Yeah. Serious discussion. Yeah, serious discussion. It has involved us ever since. Furthermore, the problems we face in this world affect not only us, but also all other country, creatures, even plants and insects. We all die sooner or later. Romans and, 8, 22, For we know that up to the present time, all of creation groans with pain, like the pain of childbirth. Good news, Bible. 
So how should we respond when we know these things are true? These kinds of questions have been raised by faithful believers for many centuries. Notice these words from Habakkuk. Maybe you haven't thought about Habakkuk for a while. Um, yeah. Habakkuk, we don't, he didn't tell us when he was born. I mean, we don't have any record of when he was born or when he died, but uh, he lived just before the Babylonian conquest of Jerusalem. So you have an idea of what's happening, and what's coming. Okay, Habakkuk 1, 1 to 4. This is the message that the Lord revealed to the prophet Habakkuk. O oh Lord, how long must I call for help before you listen, before you save us from violence? Why do you make me see such trouble? How can you endure to look at such wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are all around me, and there is fighting and quarreling everywhere. Kind of sounds like today. Yeah. Um, the law is weak and useless, and justice is never done. Evil people get the better of the righteous, and the and so justice is perverted. Good news, Bible. As I mentioned, we don't know exactly when Habakkuk was born or when he died, but we do know that he prophesied just before the Babylonian invasion of Judah, probably the first time, which occurred in 605 B.C. If one trusts God to be on his or her side and takes care of him or her, and if one had a complaint such as Habakkuk's, wouldn't you expect God to come to your rescue? Well, notice what happened. Continuing with Habakkuk 1, starting with verse 5 from the Good News Bible. Then the Lord said to his people, Keep watching the nations round you, and you will be astonished at what you see. I am going to do something that you will not believe when you hear it. I am bringing the Babylonians to power, those fierce, restless people. They are marching out across the world to conquer other lands. They spread fear and terror, and in their pride they are a law to themselves. Their horses are faster than leopards, fiercer than hungry wolves. Their horsemen come riding from distant lands, their horses paw the ground. They come swooping down like eagles attacking their prey. Their armies advance in violent conquest, and everyone is terrified as they approach. Their captives are as numerous as grains of sand. They treat kings with contempt and laugh at high officials. No fortress can stop them. They pile up earth against it and capture it. Then they sweep on like the wind and are gone. These men whose power is their God. Hmm. Some of the people, yes. If you don't mind, um, this is 605 BC, kind of. This is where we are right now. It's about yeah. 605 BC. Yeah. So the, the, the state of Israel, what was going on then? Uh, well, the state of Israel, God would not have allowed it to be conquered except if it had not been in a terrible condition already. So Israel actually was gone. The northern kingdoms were gone by that time. Yeah, the northern the, kingdom. The southern kingdom of Judah. Was, was still, was still yeah. there. Still, yeah. The northern kingdom of Israel, that's what you're talking about. Right. It was under Assyria. 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 It was conquered by Assyria 100 and, about 113, well, it would be 118 years before this 605 B.C. So the northern kingdom of, Assy was of Israel was gone and I mean, and the border of that kingdom came right up to within about five miles of Jerusalem where Habakkuk was living. Mm. So you can sort of realize, hmm, this is not too friendly. The Babylonians were warlike people. They built the first real empire in our world. They conquered nations on every side. The northern kingdom of Israel, as we've just been not noticing, had been conquered and the people scattered across the Assyrian kingdom in 722, 723, 722 BC. Remember that we're, we're counting down. The southern kingdom of Judah, where Habakkuk lived, had survived for an additional 115 or more years. So now how would you respond? Look at Habakkuk's response. Very interesting. And I will share that with you, continuing in the book of Habakkuk. Uh, verses, what, chapter 1, verses 12 to 17. Lord, from the very beginning, you are God. You are my God, holy and eternal. Lord, my God of protector, you have chosen the Babylonians and made them strong so that they can punish us. But how can you stand these treacherous evil men? 
Your eyes are too holy to look at evil, and you cannot stand the sight of people doing wrong. So why are you silent while, the, while they destroy people who are more righteous than they are? How can you treat people like fish or like a swarm of insects that have no ruler to direct them? The Babylonians catch people with hooks as though they were fish. They drag them off in nets and shout for joy over their catch. They even worship their nets and offer sacrifices to them because their nets provide them with the best of everything. Are they going to use their swords forever and keep on destroying nations without mercy? That's, of course, from our Good News translation. Well, Habakkuk then responds. Jim? Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. I will climb my watchtower and wait to see what the Lord will tell me to say and what answer he will give to my complaint. The Lord gave me this answer. Write down clearly on clay tablets what I reveal to you so that I can be excuse me, so that it can be read at a glance. Put it in writing because it is not yet time for it for it to come true. But the time is coming quickly, and what I show you will come true. It may seem slow in coming, but wait for it. It will certainly take place, and it will not be delayed. And this is the message. Those who are evil will not survive, but those who are righteous will live because they are faithful to God. Good news, Bible. Do you recognize that last phrase there? This will live by faith. Uh, what's, what's his name? Yeah. Martin, Martin Luther, Luther was famous. really, really attracted to that phrase. It's quoted, well, not, not only that, Paul was too. Paul quotes it several times in the New Testament. And it was, ways, the, righteous, the righteous shall live by his faith or, or something. By faith alone. There's, yeah. there's two. By faith alone, maybe. Yeah, that was a well, book. Well, that's, that's where it's coming from. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Martin Luther didn't waste, he said, by faith alone in German. He said a line, I think a it yeah, was. A line, yeah, a line, yeah. Um, so, so did Martin Luther get it from Habakkuk or from Paul? Well, he got it from Paul. Yeah. Paul, Paul got it from Habakkuk. Uh, and it's interesting the way it's it's very neat. I don't know Hebrew well enough to answer it on the Hebrew side, but on the Greek side, the way it's written, you can't tell for sure. There, it says here, you know, uh, those who are righteous will live because they are faithful to God or live by their faith. It can't, you can't tell whether they're righteous because of their faith or they will live because of their faith. And Paul probably intentionally wrote it that way to mean both. They're righteous because of the faith, and they live because of their faith. But we go to Abraham. Mm -hmm. his, his faith was counted as righteousness. Yep. Genesis 15, 6. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is important to notice that Packard, too, is quoted several times by Paul, as we've already mentioned, as one of the key texts for his understanding of the plan of salvation. The problem is that we human beings are very impatient. We want things to happen now. Most Christians will agree that God is preparing a place for us to live forever with Him in heaven. There will be no death, no crying, no disease, no sin. It will be a perfect environment. But we do not want to think about what comes between now and then. So why would it be necessary for us to go through a time of trouble in order to prepare us for living in a perfect environment? Does that mean uh, we have to go through the crucible? And why is the crucible necessary? Well, we may be surrounded by evil now, but we have no idea what is coming. Could it be worse than the Holocaust? Or World War II or the Black Plague in the Middle Ages? Jesus himself compared our day to the days of Noah. Luke 17, 26 and 27. What does that imply? We need always to remember that the context of the great controversy in each situation. God has already won the great controversy, but this has made the devil angry and he is all the more determined to delay God's final victory because he cannot win in the end. So the only way he can succeed in any sense is to just to delay uh, God's victory. Look at the incredible conclusion to Habakkuk's book in his prayer to God. Carrie? Uh, reading from Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. <clears throat> I hear all this and I tremble. My lips quiver with fear, my body goes limp, and my feet stumble beneath me. I will quietly wait for the time to come 
when God will punish those who attack us. Even though the fig trees have no fruit and no grapes grow on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no corn, even though the sheep all die and the cattle stalls are empty, I will still be joyful and glad, because the Lord is my Savior. The Sovereign Lord gives me strength. He makes me sure-footed as a deer and keeps me on safe, rather, on the mountains. That's from the Good News Bible. Now, if you're a subsistence farmer and you're, you and your family live based on what you can grow and what your animals produce, what do you do when there's nothing on the vines, there's no olives, there's no corn, there's no sheep, there's no cattle? You starve. You starve. Yeah. Surely this demonstrates that Habakkuk had some idea about the plan of salvation and the great controversy even in his day. So you couldn't, you couldn't be rejoicing in the Lord in that kind of a situation unless you realize that God has something better down the line, right? Yeah. What did Oswald Chamber have in mind when he wrote the following? Oswald Chamber wrote, Chambers wrote, have you been asking God what he is going to do? He will never tell you. God does not tell you what he is going to do. He reveals to you who he is. Wow. He reveals to you who he is. Hmm. What does that mean? He's omnipotent. Omniscient. He's omniscient. Omnipresent. Omnipresent. There are certain things that we know for sure if we are faithful Bible believers. Through the life and death of Jesus Christ, God has won the great controversy. Amen. He will be the final ruler of the universe. Although things may look bad today, the end will never be in doubt. Another person whose life illustrates some of the issues we, that we talk about in this discussion is Job. And we, we love to talk about Job, I hope all of us. We've done it several times anyway. Yes. Including recently. Yeah. yeah. We know nothing about Job's life before the book began, except that he was married, had a number of children and friends, and was very wealthy. But then God had that discussion with the devil in heaven, and all hell broke loose for Job. Now, I've st I, I stop and I think about these verses. I always try to think, okay, if that were me, I mean, here you are, you're behaving yourself, you're right. God says you're righteous, you know, you're, you get along with all your friends, etc. And somebody somewhere in another part of the universe has this discussion, and all of a sudden, look what happens to you. Is that fair? And Job didn't know anything about that discussion until no. later, until the end of this. Did he really? Did he ever? Well, God told him. We don't know. Didn't he? I well, don't have any, have, we, we, Moses wrote the book. Job didn't. So we may, maybe Job knew and then he told somebody who told Moses or maybe he told Moses himself. We don't know. Or maybe God told Moses who wrote the story down. We just don't know how, he, how it happened. So, well, God had that discussion in heaven. So Job lost all his wealth. He lost his children. Even his wife said, you're still as faithful as ever, aren't you? Why don't you curse God and die? Job 2.9. After 35 chapters of discussions between Job and his four friends, God suddenly entered the conversation. He started to ask a number of questions. 60 jaw-dropping questions. See Job 38 and 39. I mean, an example of that is, where were you when I set up the earth? And were you there when I decided where the oceans would stop? And things like that. And you're what? <laughs> what do I know about that stuff? It's interesting to notice that if you read through the book of Job, you realize it is Job's friends who thought they had all the answers. But Job repeatedly said, if I just knew. So when you say, if I just knew, what are you saying? I don't know. You don't have the answers, right? You don't claim the answers. So I'm inclined to think all those questions that God raised were probably more addressed toward Job's friends, which raises the next question as we move on, we'll see. Job 40, verses three to five. Job said, I spoke foolishly, Lord. What can I answer? 
I will not try to say anything else. I have already said more than I should. That's again from our Good News Bible. Then God raised many more questions. Do you think those questions were addressed to Job or on, and only to Job? Or were they addressed also to Job's friends? Did those friends hear the questions from God? Just as Job did or, or not? You think one of those friends might have told the story to Moses? I don't think so. I don't think they were converted. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you have to be converted to tell the story? Well, you have to be converted to tell the, the whole story. I see. Well, finally, we come to Job 42, 1 to 6. Jim? Us. I think I'm sorry, Myra. My. Sorry, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> then Job answered the Lord, I know, Lord, that you are all-powerful, that you can do anything you want. You ask how I dare to question your wisdom when I am so very ignorant. I talked about things I did not understand, about marvels too great for me to know. You told me to listen while you spoke and to try to answer your questions. In the past, I knew only what others told me, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. So I'm ashamed of all I have said. I repent in dust and ashes. Good news, Bible. Wow. Okay. Yeah. What did he mean when he said, I have seen you with my own eyes? That's going to be an issue when we talk about Jacob and Moses. Did he did, see him as a person? Did God come down and appear as a human being when he when he gave all those challenging questions? Did Job see God when he was going through all that suffering, through the, uh, his family being killed, his houses being destroyed, his herds being destroyed and run off? And well, he sure is... heard a lot about a reputation that, that was attributed to God. Yeah. yeah. Job's it, reputation was heart tarnished too, almost as much as God's. Well, yeah, I mean, but in in effect, though, it was Job's reputation was being tarnished or destroyed. Dispunched. But uh, uh, God's, in, in, it was all, was, there was, everything was bad was happening. It was attributed to God. Let's put it yeah. that way. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, well, the, 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 but was Job? At, I mean, we're at the end of Job when I read that text. Is it? Um, or close, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, is it fair to say that God said, okay, I have put you through all of this. Let me at least show you a little bit of me, mm. whether it be in a human form, but something that Job could go, yes. All we're doing is engaging in sanctified speculation. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> because at the, 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 we don't get to about... Uh, 4211 thereabouts it yeah. says uh, it began to because we, well we got verse 7 obviously mm -hmm. verses 7 and 8 that really are the crux of it and uh, most Bible translations and, and study Bibles don't even know what this is all, all about yeah I, I've collected yeah. I've got about 46 Bible uh, study Bibles in English mm. and I have uh, about 15 commentaries that I've copied all of that stuff. I went over to the library and copied those pages off. Only one or two maybe address one little point. The rest of it, they just don't know what it is. Pure speculation on, on yeah. that part. And part of the reason is, or the main reason is, they don't un understand the great controversy and yep. they don't believe yes. in the devil. Yep. Well, that's yeah. that's if they had if they had that, maybe it could be get to the point. But if they, their presupposition is there is no. Devil. Yeah. And, uh, well, at least Job was willing to admit that he, didn't, he did not have all the answers. He bowed humbly before God and essentially said, I'm sorry that I've said so much. While it is true that Job, quote, repented near the end of the discussion, it was Job's friends who were the real culprits and needed to repent. Notice what God said about them. Now, I don't know... Here it has God specifically addressing one of them. So I'm, I, I'm inclined to think that that whole discussion by God, I think they all heard it. That, that's my thought. Anyway, Carrie? 
Job 40, oh, two, John, seven, Gordon, eight. I'm sorry. After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz, I am angry with you and mm -hmm. your two friends because you did not speak the truth about me as my servant Job did. Mm -hmm. In other words, Job was right, you guys are wrong. Yeah. Now take seven bulls and seven rams to Job and offer them as a sacrifice for yourself. Seven bulls and seven rams, that must be a perfect sacrifice, right? Job will pray for you and I will answer his prayer and not disgrace you as you deserve. You did not speak the truth about me as he did. Good news Bible. Bible. If was, you, uh, the Septuagint version, uh, in verse 8, it says, <laughs> you have not to told the truth about Job. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it, well, it, in most of the other translations, it, it just is talking about your, about the, what they're saying about God. But in the Septuagint, it says... Uh, yeah, that, that would be the Greek translation. I, I got the, something somewhere that Eliphaz was younger. Eliphaz? Yeah. The Did one who's younger would... would Elihu, wouldn't it? Would, oh, was okay. Elihu, the one who later came involved. The not not Eliphaz. Huh? I, huh? Well... The, yeah. He says... I, uh, Elihu comes on the scene and he says, well, you older guys, I thought you would get this all resolved, but now, you know, let me speak. And About 40 years ago, thereabouts, or maybe more than that, uh, Richard Neese uh, in his series of tapes, and I listened to it several times because he was under, uh, under the impression with what he said there that Eliphaz was, was God's man and, and really explained it. And Eli, in my way, I read it, he was as bad as the other three. Oh yeah. Uh, in, in the, yeah. This really should be Eliphaz, you and th your three friends, and not been yeah. telling the truth rather yeah. than uh, four friends. And the question was, I raised, and that's why I went through all the, I used the uh, translation. I think I used the Good News translation, and I took all those uh, uh, um, chapters where where the friends of Job, because you, uh, you yeah. pointed out before, you, you got that head uh, heading of each one of the guys that doing the talking. And it almost like jumped out, so I, 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 I made them into bold type, uh, that uh, God punishes and God destroys were the lies that were t told by the friends of Job. Oh, and and they, they, they thought every, anything bad happens is God's responsible. Oh, isn't it even today, act of exactly. God? Oh, yeah. Of course. You know? Well, in the insurance policy, it says acts, acts of, of God. Of God. Yes. But uh, this is so clear. He allowed it to happen. Yeah. That's the whole thing. Yeah. He allowed it to happen, then we, he gets blamed. It is interesting to note that God never answered any of the why questions, either those of Job or of Job's friends. This story reveals a fascinating paradox. Hope and encouragement can spring from the realization that we know so little instinct so little. Instinctively, we try to find comfort by knowing everything. So if you know everything, then you don't, there are no surprises, right? Mm -hmm. So we become discouraged um, when we cannot know. But sometimes God highlights our ignorance so that we may, be, uh, may realize that human hope can find security only in a being much greater than ourselves. And that's from our Bible study guide from Monday. Are there things happening in our day that are hard to understand? Does it help to understand the great controversy in God's position in the universe? Does it help to know that even though we cannot see God, He is walking beside us every day? Tim? Isaiah chapter 41, verse 13. I am the Lord your God. I strengthen you and say, do not be afraid. I will help you. Good news, Bible. When God seems far away, who is it that has moved? God does not change, and he's not moved, so if it seems he's far away, it is because we are the ones who have moved. There are many passages in the Bible suggesting we need to be afraid. We need not be afraid. We need to have hope. For example, Isaiah 41, 8 to 14. We can read a few of those verses. Let me just do that. But you, Israel, my servant, you are the people that I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. I brought you from the ends of the earth. I called you from its farthest corners and said to you, you are my servant. I did not reject you, but chose you. And do not be afraid. I'm with you. I'm God. But nothing, let nothing terrify you. And, and, and so on. In Isaiah's day, the Assyrians were attacking and conquering the northern kingdom of, called Israel, which was just a few miles away from Isaiah's home. 
there was reason to be afraid. Think of what a difference it would make to recognize that God is not only all-powerful, living light years away, but also He is standing next to us and ready to hold our hand. So Isaiah is a good 120 years before Habakkuk that we yes. just read. Yes, yeah. Here's something to try. Whenever you feel like there's a challenge or a problem, try to remember that uh, God has already won the great controversy and that He wants to hold your hand. See what difference that makes. Challenge for you too for this next week, okay? Someone in the days of Daniel and Ezekiel and Jeremiah wrote this psalm. We don't know for sure who wrote it. Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon we sat down. There we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows nearby we hung up our harps. How can we sing a song to the Lord in a foreign land? Babylon, you will be destroyed. Happy are those who pay you back for what you have done to us. You take our babies, you smash them. It's your babies. Oh, yeah, your babies, and smash them against a rock. It's from the Good News Bible. Does that sound like something that God would authorize? Smashing babies against a rock? Smashing our enemies' babies? Yeah. Sounds kind of brutal. Yeah. Jeremiah lived through all three invasions and sieges of Judah and Jerusalem. After all the long sieges, the lack of food, and constantly living in fear for one's life, and you remember Jeremiah was let down into that mud pit and so forth, all the awful things they, they did to him and for him and so forth. Um, Charles? But he lived through, right? Yeah, he lived through. But Isaiah did not. He got killed. Isaiah, well, Isaiah wasn't there. He wasn't killed by one of the enemies. Isaiah was killed by Manasseh, the king of Judah. Yeah, he was. Hezekiah, his, there was Hezekiah, was a good king, and Isaiah worked all through his time, and the two of them worked together. And then there was Ammon, and he was bad, but he only lasted a couple of years. And then there came Manasseh. And when Manasseh showed up, he immediately thought, I don't like the like, I do not like the likes of Isaiah. And uh, there's an apocryphal story, we don't know if it's true or not, that Isaiah was trying to hide in a hollow log, but they saw a corner of his garment hanging out, and they I only chopped the tree down, but they saw it law, they saw it Isaiah in half. Imagine that inside of a hollow log. Just before I start, a uh, little side thing. Uh, Assyria was in business at the time. Nineveh was the capital. capital. So was Assyria also a world kingdom like Babylon? Well, not quite as extensive. Not, right, but they yeah. were pretty strong. Yes. And before that, perhaps, was the first one was Egypt, maybe? Yes. So Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Babylon Medo Persia, Greece, Rome. Thank you. Jeremiah 29, 1 through 13. I wrote a letter to the priests, the priests, the leaders of the people, and all the others whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken away as prisoners from Jerusalem to Babylonia. The Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all people, all those people whom he allowed Nebuchadnezzar to take away as prisoners from Jerusalem to Babylonia. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what you grow in them. Marry and have children. Then let your children get married so that they also may have children. You must increase in numbers and not decrease. Work for the good of the cities where I have made you go as prisoners. So who, Pray, who, who's, who, who made them grow? I the made... Himself. I made them go, yeah. Pray to me on their behalf. Uh -huh. Pray to me on their behalf because they are prosperous. You will be prosperous too. I, the Lord, the God of Israel, warn you not to let yourselves be deceived by the prophets who live among you or by any others who claim they can predict the future. Do not pay any attention to their dreams. 
They are telling you lies in my name. I did not send them. I, the Lord Almighty, have spoken. These are pretty powerful. Now let me, yeah, let's, let's stop and talk about that for a moment. Here is this group of people, most of the people formerly living in Israel and Judah. In, in Judah now, but probably some who formerly lived in Israel as well, have been forcibly deported to Babylonia, not to the city of Babylon, but at least to Babylonia, working probably as slaves or farmers or whatever, doing all kinds of things for the Babylonians. And you can imagine, I mean, how they would feel. I'm sure they weren't treated very well and so forth. Ezekiel was with them over there. But Jeremiah is still back in Jerusalem. And for some reason, this would be a question we should ask, why does God give a message to Jeremiah to be given to the people over in Babylonia, hundreds of miles away? But that's what happened, and... Uh, and how did they get that message? And how did they get, well, he sent it with some people, um, some people who were going there to, on some kind of a journey. So that's how it got there. But uh, over there you are, you're, you're away from your country, and there's some prophets that say, and if you go read Jeremiah, there are people there prophesying, oh, don't worry, we're going to go home in a couple years. This Babylonian thing is no big deal, da, 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 we're going to be going home. And, and Jeremiah from far away writes, no, he says, he says it'll be 70 years. Don't believe those people are saying you can go back in a couple years. Imagine, so we have to be discerning. That's, that's so important. Someone comes, that says the Lord. Mm -hmm. Be careful. Yeah, exactly. Right, remember the Old Testament uh, prophet yeah. lied. On first first Old, Kings 13. Right, yeah. right. Wow. How do we know which prophet to believe? Yes, exactly. He's got his collar put on the correct way, and you know, and, uh, and his ring, and whatever <laughs> it goes over the trappings. I tell you every now and then, I don't watch TV, but then in the place in Ohio, so many people are watching these different prophets. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable what's going on today. Yes. Yeah. Today. Yep. The Lord says, when the Babylonians, 70 years are over, I will show you my concern for you and keep my promise to bring you back home. But only a handful of people came Only back. a handful of them chose to come. One or two percent, it's estimated. Mm. Ooh. I alone know the plans I have for you, plans to bring you prosperity and not disaster, plans to bring about the future you hope for. Then you will call to me. I will come and pray to you, to me. Okay, I will come and pray to me. I will answer you. You will seek me and you will find me because you will seek me with all your heart. Very good, we like that last verse, yes. which is a very good one. Sorry, I had to bump the edge of my thing here and took off to Timbuktu somewhere. Seven years may seem like a long time to us. However, to God, it is just a short time. But God's promise was that one day, the 70 years of captivity would be over. Notice the details of the promises that God made to them. One, God told them in Jeremiah 29, 4, that he was the one who was responsible for carrying them into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. God did not abandon them. And I have to keep reminding people when we study about this, it's very important. Many people, many of the ancient peoples in those days believed, in fact, this is even in the Bible in one place, believed that gods, the different gods were assigned to different territories. So if you wanted to pray to Yahweh, for example, you had to be in Yahweh's country. Over in Babylonia, you have to pray to Marduk. You can't pray to Yahweh over in, in Babylon. That was what a lot of people believed. So, this God's... Probably 32, 8, and 9 would, could give you that impression too. Yeah. Two, God told them that while they were going to be in Babylonian exile for a number of years, they should not give up hope. God was still with them. For finally, God said that after 70 years, he was going to give them an opportunity to return to their homeland. Notice that God explained that he was in charge of their past, their present, and even their future. Then he gave them this great promise. Myra, I think that's yours. Sorry. 
Jeremiah 29, 11 to 14. I alone know the plans that I have for you, plans that will bring you prosperity and not dis disaster, plans to bring about the future you hoped for. Then you will call to me. You will come and pray to me, and I will answer you. You will seek me, and you will find me, because you seek me with all your heart. Yes, I say, you will find me, and I will restore to you your land. I will gather you from every country, from every place to which I have scattered you, and I will bring you back to the land from which I sent you away into exile. I, the Lord, have spoken. Good news, Bible. Now, I need to say a couple things here really quickly. It's true that the, te the northern kingdom of Israel, those people were scattered across the Assyrian territory. But a number of years later, when Babylon conquered Assyria, then and then finally in the days of Medo-Persia, now this is quite a long time later, they said any Israelite who wants to go back can still go back. So that's how that we come in the times of Jesus. There were still people there from some of those northern tribes because some of them answered the call even years and years and years later and came back. Okay? Do you as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian believe that those promises given to the Jews in the days of Jeremiah could apply to you in our day? Try reading Jeremiah 29, 11 to 14, and putting your name in each place after the word you. Interesting exercise. Moving to the New Testament, we notice that the author of Hebrews, who was probably Paul, said that we need the discipline uh, that we go through. Hebrews 12, 5 through 13. Have you forgotten the encouraging words that God speaks to you as his sons and daughters? My child, pay attention when the Lord corrects you, and do not be discouraged when he rebukes you, because the Lord corrects everyone he loves and punishes everyone he accepts as his child. Okay, who, who punishes people that he accepts as his children? Says the Lord. The Lord does. He does that himself, or he waits for somebody else to do it? Well, Job was punished by someone else. <laughs> yeah? Punished by the devil. But Hebrews, Paul thought, the Lord himself did it. Yeah. Go ahead. Verse 7. <clears throat> Endure what you suffer as being father's, a father's punishment. Your suffering shows that God is treating you as his children. Was now, there's it, another place suggesting that God himself is doing it, doesn't it? Yeah. What, what, exactly what he does, that's the question. Was there ever a child who was not punished by his father? If you are not punished as all his children are, it means you are not his, not his real children, are not real children, but bastards. In the case of our human fathers, they punished us and we respected them. How much more then should we submit to our spiritual father and live? Our human fathers punished us for a short time as it seemed right to them, but God does it for our own good so that we may share his holiness. When we are punished, it seems to us at the time something to make us sad, not glad. Later, however, those who have not been disciplined by those who have been those who have been disciplined by such punishment reap the peaceful reward of a righteous life. Lift up your tired hearts then, and hands. Lift up your tired hands then, and strengthen your trembling knees. Keep walking on straight paths, so that the lame foot may not be disabled, but instead be healed. Good News Bible. Great. This passage is full of references to discipline of various kinds. In the Greek world in which Paul was writing, these words were synonymous with the word for education. God is educating us by giving examples of faith. The great example is Hebrews 11. If we have problems with our faith or in trusting God, the key is to fix our eyes upon Jesus. That's what we're told to do in Hebrews 12, too. Who is a great example when times are difficult? Jesus. We need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, remembering all that he went through. He came from heaven voluntarily to live the life he lived and die the death he died on this earth. 
Now, you know that many of our Christian friends have the idea that he came just for one purpose only, to die, to pay the price for our sins. No, there was a lot more to it. And then he did do it with the law. Yeah. That hung him to the cross. <laughs> yeah. He knew that at any moment he could have abandoned us and gone back to heaven, but he did not. What kind of a courage did that give us? Have we ever been so troubled by things that we were near the point of death? Notice the important points made in Hebrews 12, 1 through 13. God, one, God is the source of our discipline. Two, our response should be to endure, to learn respect, but to, but to submit to his training. Three, what is the goal of his discipline? It is for our own good. It is a peaceable, peaceful, I'm sorry, reward of a righteous life. Looking again at Hebrews 12, 1 through 13, notice a list of things that are given as examples and grounds for hope. There's an incredible list. Look at that list. One, what's the reasons for hope? One, the example of Jesus. Two, the cloud of witnesses in Hebrews 11. If you, if you need some examples of faith, here's a whole chapter full of examples of faith. Three, Jesus did not give up because of the cross. Four, Jesus is now seated at the right hand of God. Five, God has encouraging words for us. Six, your suffering shows that God is treating you as his children. Seven, God disciplines us for our own good so that we may share his holiness, the peaceful reward of a righteous life. And eight, the lame foot may not be disabled, but instead be healed. Wow, what a list. God intends for us to continue our education for eternity. I hope so. I hope so. I have so many questions that I want to ask, so many things I want to learn. Think of the school that Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden. God plans to reestablish that school as soon as he can get his faithful people prepared to enter his kingdom. And I will tell you that if you read um, the two chapters in Desire of Ages that focus on the childhood and youth of Christ, it says there that God was his instructor and the angels were his instructor, besides his mother, of course, and so forth. But that would be pos that's possible even for us. God was his instructor, the angels were his instructors. Luke chapter 2, verse 50. Oh, Luke 252, Luke, which 52, says, right. he, he, uh, right. that one, yeah, exactly. Right. He grew with wisdom and he increased in, and I'm trying to remember the Knowledge. king, he increased in wisdom and stretch and knowledge of, of God and man, God and man something like that. Well, um, in that school, we will learn about the roles that our guardian angels have played. Imagine learning about all they knew about us. How would you like to talk to your guardian angel? Jim? On the right is Ellen White. There, every power will be developed, every capability increased. The grandest enterprise will be carried forward. The loftiest aspirations will be reached, the highest ambitions realized. And still, there will arise new heights to surmount, new wonders to admire, new truths to comprehend, fresh objects to call forth the power of body and mind and soul. Ellen White. Education 207. I, you know, this is a contradiction. If you look at just the grammar here, you can't reach the highest, the greatest, and so forth, and yet there's more. But uh, it's not hard for me to understand. I love to climb mountains, and my wife has given up climbing with me because she said, you always say, that's the top right there, and we get to that top. <laughs> oh, no, there's another one beyond that. And you, and you get to the top of that. Oh, there's another one beyond that. <laughs> yeah, so I understand that kind of language. Carrie? Uh, the badge of Christianity. The badge of Christianity is not an outward sign, not the wearing of a cross or a crown, but it is that which reveals the union of man with God. By the power of His grace, manifested in the transformation of character, the world is to be convinced that God has sent His Son as its Redeemer. No other influence that can surround the human soul has such power as the influence of an unselfish life. The strongest argument in favor of the gospel is a loving and lovable Christian. That's an incredible statement. The strongest argument in favor of the gospel is a loving and lovable Christian. 
Don't we wish there were more of them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The fact that we are called upon to endure trials shows that the Lord Jesus sees in us something precious which he desires to develop. If he saw in us nothing whereby he might glorify his name, he would not spend time in refining us. He does not cast worthless stones into his furnace. It is valuable ore that he refines. The blacksmith puts the iron and steel into the fire that he may know what metal of metal they are. The Lord allows his chosen ones to be placed in the furnace of affliction to prove what temper they are of and whether they can be fashioned for his work. That's from Ellen G. White, Ministry of Healing, page 470, and then it goes on with another lot of numbers. Several lessons emerge in our present study. One, God widens our horizons so that we may locate ourselves and our experience within the larger framework of the plan of salvation and the great controversy. We need to see where we are in this big picture. Two, God presents himself to us as the creator and the redeemer, the one who loves us and is present with us at all times. Three, God reveals to us his plans with us and for us. We are not expendable elements in the crisis. Look at the promise that Jesus made. John chapter 10, verse 10 to 15, 28 to 29. The thief comes only in order to steal, kill and destroy. I have come in order that you might have life, life in all its fullness. I'm the good shepherd who is willing to die for his sheep. When the hired man who is not a shepherd and does not own the sheep sees a wolf coming, he leaves the sheep and runs away. So the wolf snatches the sheep and scatters them. The hired man runs away because he's only a hired man and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. As the Father knows me, and I know the Father, in the same way I know my sheep, and they know me, and I am willing to die for them. I give them eternal life, and they shall never die. No one can snatch them away from me. What my Father has given me is greater than everything, and no one can snatch them away from the Father's care. Good wow. John 17, 1 and 2, that's what he basically said again. Yeah. That I, so Paul, given. Yeah. So Paul wrote a great deal about faith, hope, and love. And you remember 1 Corinthians 13, 13, the greatest of these is love. Mm. There are many other verses that talk about hope. All of those verses look beyond our present troubles to the future country, our eternal kingdom. Hebrews 11, 1. I have faith. No, too heavy. To have, <laughs> to have faith, is to be sure of the things we hope for, to be certain of the things we cannot see. Think of the examples of the faithful mentioned in Hebrews eleven thirty three to thirty nine. The whole chapter is, you know, full of the faithful. But this is this is a very interesting group at the end there. Paul suffered a great deal. He had, we have looked at some of the passages that describe his difficulties early in his life. But Paul gloried in his sufferings because he believed that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character produces hope, Romans 5, 4. Hope is also discussed in Romans 12, 2 Corinthians 4, Hebrews 12, 5, Romans 8, etc. As we have already mentioned, patiently looking forward to a future reward is difficult for, difficult for us impatient humans. A fairly complete list of what the Bible says about hope can be seen in these passages. From the Bible Study Guide, and I believe this is the Teacher's Guide. Yeah. Biblical, biblical hope is anchored in God, not in ourselves, and there are several references. As three, all three persons of the Godhead are part of the fountain of hope, God the Father loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. 2 Thessalonians 2.16 and others. Christ Jesus and his gospel of grace are our hope, several references. The Holy Spirit brings the mountain, brings and maintains hope in the lives of the believers, several references. All of these can be found in our handout on yes. theox.org. 
Yes. Without God, there is no hope in life, no covenant, and thus we are estranged from God, with references. But in Christ, we all have the same hope given by God to Israel through the gospel, with references. The gospel, the apostle Peter tells us that God is our Father who gave us a, quote, living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, 1 Peter 1, 3. God's hope is already valid for our present life. Our hope is fixed on salvation through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. This hope gives us, in this life, numerous benefits, both spiritual, such as the relationship with God, and psychological, peace, optimism, etc. The hope of the glory of God is the justification of sinners by grace, through faith, by which God gives us peace, in Jesus Christ. The hope does, this hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So this hope is not, so this hope is not a false one. Rather, this hope is based on God's concrete actions. That is, just at the right time. Christ died for the ungodly. Thus, Jesus demonstrated his love for us, saving us from our sins and reconciling us with God. Do you want, uh, there's uh, we've a got, fair amount more. I'll go ahead. But Christ's first advent and his sacrifice on the cross are not the end of the redemption story. The apostle Paul tells us that, quote, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable, 1 Corinthians 15, 19. For this reason, our hope is anchored in the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, who will resurrect us for an eternal and glorious life. Several references. Paul declared that he was persecuted because of the hope of the resurrection. The resurrection was not an invention of Paul, but was the same hope that God gave to the fathers of Israel. I think we better interrupt there. We're about running out of time. Uh, you're free to go to our website, www.theox.org, and you can get our handout and read this extensive, uh, basically biblical study on hope, and it's, it's a very good one. So in conclusion, Daniel also had hope. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for this privilege we've had of studying about the great characters of Scripture. Some of them not so familiar, like Habakkuk, but others very, very familiar, Job and Moses and Jesus Christ himself. May we, have, may we find courage in studying their stories, of following their example is our prayer, and may it soon lead to your second return is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.